Hi, this is Dr. A, and this is a video review on prealbumin and globulins. We're going to cover a few of the globulins, but not all of them. All right, so the first one is prealbumin, also known as transthyretin. It is a transporter protein. Uh, it is a serum and spinal fluid carrier of the thyroid hormone thyroxine and retinol binding protein bound to retinol, which is vitamin A. Uh, it gains its name from transports thyroxine and retinol. So you can see here, transthyretin, okay, transthyretin. So transport thyroxine and retinol. Retinol is vitamin A. Thyroxine is used to build thyroid hormones. And you need also vitamin A to build thyroid hormones. So it's pretty cool because then they're just uh, transported together. It is synthesized in the liver and the choroid plexus, which the choroid plexus is up in the brain there. That's part of what makes this spinal fluid, right? Uh, and obviously it's present in spinal fluid. So um, prealbumin is more sensitive to changes in protein energy status, so nutrition, uh, than albumin, although albumin will change to prealbumin will change first. Um, and so um, the concentration of prealbumin closely reflects recent dietary intake. It is a negative acute phase reactor, meaning that when you have acute inflammation and infection, this protein will go down. And it is also decreased in liver disease because uh, then in liver disease, it's um, the production of proteins is just impaired anyway. The lab procedures to measure prealbumin are usually immunoturbinometric assays or nephilometry, so on uh, cloudiness and stuff like that. Okay, the next one is alpha-1 antitrypsin. And this protein prevents the tissue destruction by blocking the en enzyme leukocyte elastase that's produced by neutrophils. Uh, it, it is an acute phase reactant, so it goes up during inflammation or infection, which makes sense because the neutrophils would be more active in those cases, and so there you'll need more alpha-1 antitrypsin to block the leukocyte elastase. So why would you block leukocyte elastase though? Because, I mean, it's producing it to destroy bacteria and stuff. It's just that that leukocyte elastase, if it hangs out, can also de destroy alveoli uh, tissue. And uh, so this is a protective enzyme. It is made in the liver. Um, well, it's a protective protein, sorry. It is made in the liver like all other proteins except for the immunoglobulins. Uh, and mutation of the serpina 1 gene causes a deficiency or an abnormal function of alpha-1 alpha antitrypsin. That abnormal alpha-1 antitrypsin can accumulate in the liver and cause cirrhosis because it's just building up in the liver. And uh, the leukocyte elastase, if it goes unchecked by the alpha-1 antitrypsin because it's not worth either not there or not functioning properly then again it damages the alveoli leading to lung damage um, so often people that have emphysema or COPD that have never smoked in their life or even been exposed to secondhand smoke or something like that um, you can pretty much bet that the cause is going to be a deficiency in alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, and it is detected by serum protein electrophoresis or the, in the automated methods by immunonephilometric um, assays. And then the protein electrophoresis, you would see the, the it's an alpha-1 globulin, so that alpha-1 globulin band would be almost non-existent or be really small. So then you have alpha fetoprotein. So uh, it is synthesized in the developing embryo in the liver, but it's also synthesized some in the parenchymal cells in the liver. The clinical correlation, so it is used as a tumor marker for primary hepatoma, ovarian cancer, and testicular embryonal carcinomas. Um, it is used also in the assessment of neural tube defects in pregnant women. So if you see a high AFP, you have a possible neural tube defects like spinal bifida. And if you see low alpha fetoprotein, uh, you can suspect Down syndrome. Uh, the timing of the collection is important when you assess uh, in pregnant women. So that, that has to be taken into consideration. It's usually done somewhere around 16 weeks. The lab methods are chemiluminescent immunoassay or enzyme labeled immunoassays. Um, and the most common prenatal screening test today is what we call the quad screen, and it has alpha fetoprotein, HCG, estriol, and inhibit A. Uh, and it screens for Down syndrome, neurotube defects, etc. All right, haptoglobin is an alpha 2 glycoprotein. It is synthesized by the liver, by the hepatocytes, again, like most other proteins. 
the function, it's an immunoglobulin-like plasma protein that binds hemoglobin. So when the hemoglobin binding capacity of haptoglobin is exceeded, though, hemoglobin starts passing through the renal glomeruli, and you will see hemo hemoglobinuria or your blood uh, square on your urine dipstick would be positive. And uh, the clinical correlation is elevated levels are seen in many inflammatory diseases and burns. Uh, it is an acute phase protein, so it goes up when inflammation. And if you see decreased levels, uh, it's indicative of hemolytic anemias because it's all being used up, um, soaking up all that hemoglobin that's been released as the red cells have been broken up. The lab method is going to be a tributometric or nephilometric immunoassays. So haptoglobin would be one of those tests you also might want to order if you suspect um, a hemolytic anemia, but like a transfusion reaction and stuff like that too. So, or any kind of hemolysis process. All right, plasmin is a copper-containing alpha-2 glycoprotein enzyme. It is synthesized in the liver. It, uh, the incorporation of copper into the structure of ceruloplasmin occurs during the synthesis of ceruloplasmin in the hepatocyte. So uh, takes the copper in the liver, takes the copper, and adds it to ceruloplasmin, and then it goes for transport. So obviously, what does it transport? Copper. And um, ferroxidase um, aids in the conversion of ferrous to ferric ions, and, and it, which enables iron to be transported from the liver, and it uses copper. The uh, clinical correlation, the acute is it is an acute phase reactant, so it also goes up with uh, inflammation. Elevated le levels are seen in inflammation, severe infection, and tissue damage. Decreased levels can be genetic, so Wilson's disease is the most common with low serum levels of ceruloplasmin, and then Menke's disease also. Um, and it can be acquired due to malnutrition or malabsorption then of you know, copper and proteins and stuff like that. Lab methods are immunoassays or nephilometry. Alpha-2 microglobulin is a large tetramer synthesized by the liver. The function is it transports hormones and enzymes. Uh, it exhibits an effector and inhibitor function in the development of the lymphatic system, and it inhibits components of the complement system, uh, system and the hemostatic system, which is the clotic system. The clinical correlation, the increased levels of alpha-2 microglobulins are found in nephrotic syndrome uh, with when all the other lower molecular weight proteins are lost. Uh, and it's because basically this guy is so big that it can just, it can't even go through the glomeruli, even with the damage. So it's just retained because it's huge. It's a huge, it's a micro, micro means big, right? So it's a microglobulin, it's a big globulin. Uh, and so it can't, it cannot be lost through the kidneys. Also, patients with acute pancreatitis will exhibit low serum concentrations, which will correlate with the severity of the disease. So if uh, the physician is trying to assess how bad pancreatitis is, this might be a test that they might order. A lot of methods, um, they're estimated using serum protein electrophoresis, but if you want def Definitive quantitation, you need to do an ELISA or a latex agglutination uh, immunoassay. All right, transferrin is a glycoprotein synthesized by the liver. It is a negative acute phase reactant, so it will go down it, with inflammation. It transports iron uh, to prevent the loss of iron through the kidneys. Iron is obviously needed to build blood. The function, transferrin transports iron to its storage sites. So um, where it is incorporated into apple ferritin and then uh, into ferritin. So stored, you store iron as ferritin. And of course, uh, transferrin also carries iron to the cells that synthesize hemoglobin, so over into bone marrow and other iron-containing compounds. Your mitochondria uh, contain iron, so iron is also part of energy production. So uh, in iron deficiency anemia, you will see elevated levels of transferrin, so it's because it's trying to get iron to where um, the blood building is happening. And um, so as much as possible, whatever's there, all right, because there's not enough. The You will see decreased production of transferrin in liver disease, obviously, because liver produces protein, in malnutrition, in um, excessive loss of transferrin via the kidneys and protein losing disorders like uh, nephrotic syndrome. 
Low transferrin levels can be can lead to decreased hemoglobin production and thus anemia because if you don't have transferrin, you can't get the iron to the iron production site, and then therefore you have um, problems producing blood cells. And if you don't have enough blood cells, you have anemia. A transfer anemia, so the total absence of transferrin can obviously lead to anemia for the same reason as low transferrin would lead to anemia, uh, but also hemosiderosis in the heart and liver because um, the the iron can still accumulate in um, in the heart and in the liver, and that could cause damage. Uh, hemosiderosis is, is the accumulation of iron in the liver. The lab methods <coughs> for transferrin are tubidometric and nephilometric immunoassays. Next, we have hemopexin, also uh, involved with blood. It's a beta globulin synthesized in the liver. It is an acute phase reactant. It binds free heme, so uh, because heme causes oxidative damage, so you can't leave it unchecked. Yet. It has to be picked up and taken care of. It binds it to a, as a one-to-one -one ratio, so every um, molecule of hemopexin can bind one heme, and it carries the heme to the liver for recycling. Low concentrations are diagnostic of hemolytic anemia because it, get, it gets used up transporting all of that free heme, and it is usually determined by radial immunodiffusion. Your lipoproteins, so they're going to get their own video, but um, just to be mentioned here because they are transport proteins, they're complexes of protein and lipids, they're mainly um, very triglycerides and cholesterol in the blood. They're classified by their apolipoproteins and their lipid uh, content. So apolipoproteins like ApoE, ApoB, ApoA, and then there's numbers and stuff like that too uh, attached to those. Um, in order from largest to smallest or least dense to most dense, you have chylomark bonds in VLDL, IDL, LDL, and HDL. So um, VLDL is very low density lipoprotein, intermediate density lipoprotein, um, LDL is low density lipoprotein and HDL is high density lipoprotein. Um, Calomicron and VLDL tend to mostly uh, ferry triglycerides. Calomicron is usually what's made in the, by the intestinal cells to transport the, uh, your dietary um, triglycerides and cholesterol to the liver and other body cells. But then uh, VLDL is actually mostly transporting triglycerides from the liver to the body cells, and they're the triglycerides that have been made from excessive carbs intake. So you have too much glucose, it'll store it up, but also will make it as triglycerides, and then VLDL ferries it. And then uh, LDL and HDL are both more uh, intimately involved in just cholesterol transport, with LDL taking it from the liver to the body cells and HDL from the body cells to the liver. All right, next you have complements. So the complement system is a defense mechanism against infections. It is made by the liver and circulate as non-functional precursors, so they have to be activated. Um, C3 is the most abundant. It is an indicator of activation of the classic pathway. And C4 is the next most abundant. Uh, there are other, obviously, but those are the two big ones that we look at. Increased C3 and C4 are linked to acute inflammation and infection. Decreased C3 is associated with autoimmune diseases. So autoimmune diseases are more like chronic infections. So uh, basically, they can get used up, if you will, uh, with the, the length of the inflammation. Uh, newborn respiratory distress syndrome and chronic hepatitis. Decreased C4 is seen in DIC, so disseminated intravascular coagulation, um, SLE, which is lupus, chronic hepatitis, and acute glomerulonephritis. Um, and those levels are usually measured by nephilometric immunoassay and turbidimetry. Urofibrinogen is one of the largest proteins in blood plasma. It is made by the liver as a glycoprotein. When activated, it becomes fibrin and helps form a clot. Uh, so it is, fibrinogen is the inactive or uh, precursor part of fibrin. Fibrinogen is elevated in, in inflammation, so it's an acute phase reactant. Um, it is elevated in pregnancy and while you take oral contraceptives. It is decreased, um, well, when you have decreased levels, it usually means that it's being used up in the clotting process. So you're looking at massive clotting, DIC, PEs, or stuff like that. And the analysis of fibrinogen looks at the clot formation time, um, usually using uh, tissue thromboplastin and stuff. 
So uh, your C-reactive protein detects inflammation. It's very nonspecific though, and it can't tell you what's causing the inflammation. It, um, the function of C-reactive protein is to activate the classic complement pathway by binding uh, to poly polysaccharides of microbes, so this, and the cell walls of microbes. The, uh, it has the so here's this correlation to inflammation. So it rises quickly and exponentially in response to an injury or acute inflammation. The levels of CRP can increase up to 2,000 fold and begin to increase within 6 to 12 hours of injury, uh, usually peaking at 48 hours. The level of CRP tends to correlate with the degree of damage and inflammation. So uh, laboratory procedures, you have uh, ELISA, immunoturbinometry, nephilometry, immunofluorescence, and immunochemiluminescence. And there's also a high sensitive CRP, and it uh, detects levels below one milligrams per uh, liter using a monoclonal antibody-based method again, an immunoassay of some sort of the ones listed in the lab procedures. And it, um, the high sensitivity CRP is used to predict risk of cardiovascular events because cardiovascular events are linked to low grade constant inflammation. So um, HSCRP is picking up the low grade inflammation. So um, you want to be below one. Um, and then of course, the higher you're above one or above three, et cetera, the higher you are, in uh, high sensitivity CRP, the more likely it is that you might experience a cardiovascular event. Um, the other CRP levels are usually like way bigger, like the looking looking for massive inflammation. They might be used, for example, to look at um, autoimmune diseases, maybe diagnose autoimmune processes, or at least indicate this this that there's inflammation going on. And then uh, also to like track treatment and recovery and stuff like that. And lastly, we have our immunoglobulins. There are antibody produced by B lymphocytes. So this is the only one in uh, all the proteins we're talking about and the globulins and stuff like that. It is not produced by the liver. So it's produced by, by B lymphocytes because B lymphocytes are the white cells that produce antibodies and antibodies are immunoglobulins. Uh, so the composition is uh, differentiated based on their heavy chain. It can be a gamma, mu, mu, alpha, delta, or epsilon, and gamma then would be IgG, mu would be IgM, alpha, IgA, delta, IgD, epsilon, IgE, right? And then each monomeric form has two heavy chains and two light chains, uh, kappa and la or lambda, and so heavy and then light chain. So you can see the formations that's a single unit. Um, and IgG is a monomer, so it looks like this. Um, it's um, the secondary immune system response. So um, it's part of your um, defense against infection. It is vaccine antibody, etc. IgM is a pentamer, so it's five of these guys with the tails and put together, kind of looks like a snowflake. It is part of the primary immune system response. So it rises first, this rises second, uh, and it can activate complements. IgA is a dimer, so it's two of these tail to tail. It is found in secretions. So anywhere there's mucus, uh, you can find IgA. And IgE is a monomer, so like this. Um, and uh, But the tail is a little bit longer than IgG, and it is prevalent in allergic reactions. So if you're allergic to peanuts or shellfish or something like that, you would be producing IgE. And then IgD is also a monomer, so it also looks like this, but it's a receptor on lymphocytes, so its tail end is actually embedded into a white cell. All right, and that is the last slide and the end of your review video. Thank you for your attention.